Good morning, everybody. We're in the book of John this morning. We're going to start chapter 2. I promise you we won't get past verse 12. How about that? It's easier to promise how far I won't go than it is how far I will go. It's the Gospel of John written by the Apostle John. Same author as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation. Uh, we just went through the, the three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and we're into the Gospel of John now. This is where we started as a church 11 years ago, and we are back. We've taught through the entire New Testament already in this time, and most of the Old Testament now. Uh, so... Lord willing, we'll get done with everything in the Old Testament, too, before he comes back. But, you know, I won't be sad if he comes back first, either. So, The Gospel of John, uh, the Apostle John here, presents Jesus as God. He, he has the seven I am statements of Jesus in this book, um, seven signs that that uh, point to him being God. A little bit different than the other three Gospels. They're called the Synoptic Gospels because they have kind of snapshots of Jesus' life and they correlate together a little more than the Gospel of John does, although there are a couple of the miracles uh, in John that are in the others because there, there's two or three that are in all four Gospels. So as we get to those, we'll identify them, but... Uh, a lot of what we see in John is not in the other Gospels. John is doesn't even refer to himself as John. He, he calls himself the Apostle Jesus loved. <laughs> I, I don't know how braggy that is or what. Um, John would have been very young during the life of his walk with the Lord, during that ministry time, that three and a half years. I uh, most believe he was probably a, an older teenager. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence of that, but we do know that John wrote this book in his older age. He lived longer than all the other apostles. He was one that was not put to death uh, like the other, the rest of the 12. He lived to be well into his 90s, which was twice the age of the average man of that time. We've already seen and been introduced to Jesus as the word. His lineage for Jesus takes him back to eternity. He says, in the beginning, just like in the book of Genesis, in the beginning was the word. Uh, so he goes all the way back to there. Matthew takes him back to Abraham. Luke takes him back to Adam. Mark presents him as a servant, so he doesn't give him a lineage at all. But John takes him all the way back to uh the beginning to eternity we've seen john the baptist <clears throat> now crying out behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world promising us that john the baptist himself was not the one he wasn't the christ that they were looking for he, he was questioned about that but that he said he was the one uh that fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, the one, the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Jesus would say that John the Baptist would have, had Israel recognized their Messiah in his first coming, would have fulfilled the prophecies of Elijah coming ahead of Messiah. That John was the greatest prophet of all. Uh, the only thing I can think of is solely because of his honor of being the herald, the one, the voice himself crying, uh, make straight the way of the Lord, going before the Christ, being able to see him, being able to baptize him. And, you know, I, I remember, and we've already covered this, so I'm going to be quick about it, but I can remember as a kid wondering why was Jesus baptized? Didn't make any sense to me other than usually the, the, the explanation you get was, well, that was the beginning of his ministry. It gives us a starting point of his ministry from that point on. And, G, and John even said, there's one coming after me who is preeminent before me, who's going to deserve greater recognition than I have. 
He didn't even keep back his own disciples and say, no, you guys stay with me. He's going to accumulate his own disciples. He sent his guys after him. Uh, but I, also, I, I wondered why that. And even John, when Jesus comes into the water, John says, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. And Jesus said, no, we need to do this so the scriptures are fulfilled. One of the things that, and one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, I guess, why you would be baptized is you were converting to Judaism. And so you had to go through all of the instruction of the law and the prophets. And then if you were a man, you had to be circumcised. The last thing you did was you entered into a baptismal or a mikvah. And when you came out of the water, it was uh, as though you had never sinned. You were as innocent as the day you were born. That's the whole point of baptism in the Jewish mind. So when you enter into something like a wedding ceremony, like we're going to look at today, or, or uh, it would actually would have been at the engagement for, for the wedding, but something significant like that, some kind of covenant thing, you were, you were baptized. You went into this mikvah. You came up out of the water. It was as though you were being born again. That's where the term actually comes from. So John was out in, in saying to Israel, to the nation of Israel, it's time for you to start a new relationship with God. They had been 400 years without any word from God. From Malachi to John, there's a 400-year silence of God. Uh, John's calling Israel to repentance. John's calling Israel to start this new relationship with God. And so he's baptizing people as though they were converting for the first time to Judaism, although that's not what was happening, but uh, it was the same significance. It's time for a new relationship, a new walk with God. And so that's why he was doing that. So Jesus comes in and, and has John baptize him, representing Israel, representing God. I'm not even actually sure which one he's representing there. Uh, maybe Israel, because he's the Messiah, and saying, yep, this time. It, it, but Nonetheless, it's about that relationship, that coming together of, of God, the Son, coming down and identifying with us to an extent or allowing us to identify with Him. But either way, entering into that covenant relationship, the Son coming to start a new covenant with Israel first and then to the Gentiles. After that, we see him call some of his first disciples. Two disciples of John leave to go and, and follow Jesus. He, he walks by. John says again, behold, the Lamb of God. Two of them take off after him to follow him. One is Andrew. One, most believe, was probably John, the, the Apostle John. And they just kind of follow him. And... Uh, he turns around and he says, what are you looking for, right? What do you seek? What are you looking for? And they say, we, we just want to see where you're staying. And he says, come and see. That's his invitation to him. That's the question for him. That's the question to all of us going through this world. What are you actually looking for? I've heard so many testimonies of people saying, I was looking for something. I was looking for satisfaction. I was looking for wholeness. I was looking for hope. And I found Jesus. And in reality, what it was is God saying, what are you looking for? I'm looking for hope. Well, then come. Come and see. I'm looking for fulfillment. Then come and see where you're going to find it. That's a question for all of us. What are you looking for? Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a while, and you just kind of feel like things are kind of stale. right? It's, there's nothing exciting about it. There's nothing... Uh, I don't know, like it just it's not moving anymore. It's just kind of cold. What are you looking for? You know, it, it's really easy right now with this world. To, what are you looking for? I'm looking to get rid of fear, man. I'm looking for hope. The world's promising hopelessness unless you do things their way. They don't promise hope if you do things their way. They're just saying it's hopeless if you don't do it our way. God says, if you want hope, come and do it my way. You come and walk with me. Andrew goes, and Andrew is one of the disciples. When you see him most of the time, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. He goes and finds Peter, brings Peter to, to Jesus. Jesus said, you're Simon, son of Jonah? 
you're going to be called Cephas, Peter, right? Petra, a rock, a stone. And the following day, in verse 43, it says, the, the following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he said, or he found Philip and said to Philip, follow me. So he went and found Philip. I always find it ex funny, it kind of tickles me a little bit when people say they found God or they found Jesus. Even, even Philip, Philip's going to run and say, we found him. But what does it say there? It says Jesus found him. All of you think that you found Jesus. Jesus found you. You love him because, the Bible says, because he loved you first. We, we didn't go find Jesus. He came and found us. We just turned around and, or we looked up and said, okay. He doesn't come and follow me. And so Philip, again, just like Andrew, he runs to Nathaniel. And he says, we have found him. So he flips it around. We found him of whom Moses in the, uh, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Matthew, Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, Nazareth didn't have a great reputation for being a great city or a great town. It, it, it was a, a place along a, a, not passageways, but, you know, different traveling routes and that kind of thing. So it was a layover spot, and it was a layover spot for Roman uh, soldiers and, and that that would come through. And so it had brothels, and it had the, the bars and stuff, and so it wasn't a great, wonderful place. And so Nathaniel just out of his cynicism, says, can anything come out of, anything good come out of, uh, come out of Nazareth? And Philip just says, just come and see. The same thing Jesus said to Andrew and, and the, other, the other disciple, Philip just says, just come and see. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to argue with you about Nazareth. Just come and see. You know, we get into a lot of arguments and we, we try to hurry up and answer questions that our friends have or our family has. You say, just come and see. I'm not going to argue with you about things. I don't even have my Bible with me. Just come and see. You know, there was a, a time when we had the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on our door and I'm standing out on the porch and I'm, I'm you know, debating with these guys. And it, one of them was the pastor of the, of the local kingdom hall. And he was a nice guy. He was being nice. But we started getting into our little debate. But I'm completely unarmed. I don't have my Bible with me. I just walked out there and pulled the door closed behind me so the kids didn't hear certain things. And all of a sudden, I just she must have known I'm taking too long out there. So she, Tracy takes my Bible and all, her hand just comes out of the door. She opens up enough just to reach her hand out and stick my Bible out to me. So I'm like, boom, here we go. You know, and, and it, was, it was on. But it was kind of a come and see. Let just see what I'm saying. See, what, see what's in the Bible. And, uh, and that's maybe a, a, an easier way for us to draw people, and, and not to draw people, but to get people to... to Get past their arguments of why not and just say, I'm not engaging in the argument. Just come and see what it says. Let God answer their questions. Take them to the word of God. Just, just come here and see. How many times, especially a long time ago, I mean a long time ago, 70s, 80s, and... You know, I know, it's my age, right? It's a long time ago. Yeah, right. yeah, well, all of us. And Lexi's the only one. That, yeah, Lexi's and, and Emma, the only ones that don't know about that. Um, well, they know about it because of all of us, but, you know, they know our music better than they know their own music, probably. Um, but how many times would do you hear stories of, of guys that just got saved, they were drug addicts before they went to church. They went to church because their girlfriend wanted them to come to church. 
They get saved at the church, and then they go out and they're just like, "Hey, man, you got to come and see this. You got to come and hear this. You got to come, come and see, come and hear." They don't know any answers, any questions. They just know God saved them. God, I don't do drugs anymore. How do you know you don't do drugs anymore? You only been clean for two days. What are you talking? You know, all of that. I just don't want it anymore. I don't. You know, come and see. He changed my life. He forgave. You know. We don't do that anymore. Now we think we have to have all these apologetic arguments and we got to be Ken Ham and we got to be this person or that person. Man, just bring them to Jesus and let him answer the questions. Now, I think you need to know the word. I think you need to know it really well. You're a disciple of his, right? These guys, these disciples didn't just go and sit, you know, in a in a room that was in the same house as Jesus and then and, and learn that way. They sat at his feet. They listened. When he got up and moved, they got up and moved. They didn't just follow him the one time and say, all right, good enough, I'm in. They continued to follow him. When Nathaniel's brought to Jesus, Jesus says, an Israelite in whom there's no deceit, and Nathaniel says, how do you know me? How do you know me? I've had people even say that about, what, what would God have to do with me? How would, you, how would you know anything about me? Sometimes pastors are even accused of, of uh, you know, having family members come and, and, and give some details of, of a friend or a family member that they got to come to church, and then you just preached at them the whole time. I don't even know who you're talking about. I don't know who you are. I don't know anything about you. Nobody said anything to me about you. Yeah, but you just hit everything that's wrong with me. Well, <laughs> I didn't. It's not me that knows you. It's God that knows you. He's the one that knows what you need to hear and, and where you're at. And he, he says, well, <laughs> before Philip came to you, I saw you under the fig tree. And evidently, this fig tree was sitting somewhere away from Jesus and and. Maybe only Philip knows where these two guys go, you know, where they hang out. And it, it was enough anyways for Nathaniel to say, Rabbi, you're the son of God. Nobody else could have known where I was at. And I think we even get a little clue into maybe what Nathaniel was at least thinking about, it, even if he wasn't reading a scroll, but what he might have been thinking about in that Jesus says, listen, after this, you'll see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You think me knowing where you were sitting a few minutes ago blows your mind? Wait until you see some of the things that I'm going to do. Wait until you are, it's revealed to you more and more who I really am. That I'm not just a good teacher. I'm not, just a pro I'm not just a man. See, they thought Messiah was just going to be a man. They didn't think of him being the son of God. They thought he would be a man who would set up a government and rule and reign in Jerusalem. And Israel would rule the world. And Jesus is saying, you haven't seen anything yet, dude. Just hang out for a while and see what God's going to do. So now we get... On the third day. It's only three days hanging with Jesus. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in, in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus and his disciples were invited to go to the or invited to the wedding. So this is a, a there's a lot of people who want to say well, the, a wedding's a private thing, so this wasn't done publicly, and other people are saying, Well, there were so many people there, this was a public miracle, not a private miracle. I'm not going to argue about that. The cool thing is that Jesus was invited to the wedding. He was known well enough in, in Capernaum. He, he and the family were known well enough. Mary was known well enough to be invited to this wedding. They didn't just invite Mary and then everybody else that he knows and she knows gets to come. It says Jesus and his disciples were invited too. So Everybody had the invitation. The most important invite, though, is Jesus and not Mary and not, not the disciples. Listen, if you want to have a good marriage and you have Jesus at your wedding, you, you invite him at the wedding. 
I try to make it very, uh, I try to really drive home the point when I'm talking to two people who are about to get married, that when they make their vows, it, it, it's not just between the two of them. Everybody there are witnesses, and I'm just a stand-in. But you make those vows and those promises, you're making them to God. This is how I'm going to treat you. Before God, this is how I'm going to treat you. So you're, you're bringing God into that wedding, into the vows. And both of them are, are making, this is three people involved in this union, in this, in this wedding, in this coming together. Not just the two. Two can become very selfish and self-centered, and, but when you remember, there was a third person there. That God himself was standing there. And he was part of that promise making. He's part of that covenant. Well, now you both have somebody else to answer to than just the other party, right? You, you have to answer to God, too. It, it's not just your wife or it's not just your husband. And, and if you want it to stay right, because, listen, if you're going to be the, the offending party in that relationship, you've got two witnesses against you. You've got the, your spouse and you've got God. They're the witnesses against you if you're out of line. So the goal then is for the husband and wife to be the two witnesses of God. To, to stay in alignment with God. Right? If you want your relationship to be solid, to be good, and listen, things are not always easy. Life is not easy. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. So it, it doesn't make it necessarily easier. And it doesn't necessarily make it harder. And it's not always happy, happy. We know that. But there's a strength that comes with the two together, with the three. Right? I mean, we use that verse during the wedding ceremonies. Uh, uh, Two-stranded cord is not easily broken, but a third strand, you know. Invite Jesus into your into your weddings. You guys have influence. We'd already we've already blown the cover that this is we're 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 the seventies and eighties crew here, right? So we have influence over younger people. It, it's not just the pastor who does the wedding uh, premarital counseling. You you have influence over younger people. Put your two cents in. It doesn't matter if they like it or not, or if they want to reject it or receive it, put it in. It's from God. Not just your two cents. Put God's two cents in. Encourage them. Go to a pastor. Encourage them. Be in the Bible. If they won't go to a pastor, man, if they'll sit and listen to you, we're, we're told to, to take the gospel to the entire world, to make disciples everywhere we go. If you get to talk to two young people who won't go to talk to a pastor, great, do it. Give them biblical counsel. You can do that. You don't have to be a licensed counselor to do it. Get your Bible out. And this is what the Bible says about marriage. This is what God expects of marriage. Encourage them that way. Do that. Be that voice. It doesn't have to be me. I tell you what it will do. It will make you get your marriage straight if you do that. Every pastor that does it, man, if they're doing it, because they got to eat those words before they can spit them out to somebody else. So if you're brave enough to do that, you're going to have to do that yourself. You're going to have to chew it all up and spit it back out to somebody else. So they're at the wedding. You know, they're, they're not surprised guests. That's kind of an important thing. They were invited to this wedding. So they're a planned guest. And some people will take this miracle that's coming up and say, well, it's because the apostles were there, or, or Jesus and the disciples were there, and so they were unexpected guests, and so it wasn't all planned for. No, they're invited, so this is a planned for thing. Verse 3 says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Right? So they didn't run out of wine because they had extra guests show up. 
That didn't happen at a Jewish wedding. You plan for a year for the number of guests that you're going to have. One of the things that happens is the, the father of the groom gathers together wedding clothes. So those who are invited to the wedding are handed a cloak or whatever he get, whatever whether he excuse me whatever he could gather up, so that in the wedding feast he would know if you belong there or not. There's a, a parable about that, isn't there? About those who are invited to the wedding feast, and the master of the feast walks through and finds somebody who doesn't have on the wedding clothes. What are you doing here? You don't belong here. And they throw him out. And we, we take that as, well, you know, people are going to try to sneak into heaven and God's going to catch him and throw him back into hell. I guess on a, on a vague, broad sense of the matter, yeah. Those who are not invited, those who are not on the list, on the guest list, don't get to come in. If your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you won't be in heaven. If you do not submit to God, if you don't answer the wedding invitation. See, Jesus talks a lot about weddings. A, a lot of his words, even if it's not a parable or a story like this about a wedding, a lot of his words have to do with the engagement and the wedding. That's why it's important to know the culture of what you're talking about, too. Now, here's the thing. If you run out of wine at, in a Jewish ceremony like this or a Jewish wedding feast, a festival, you've invited all these people, you run out of wine, you run out of anything. You run out of food. I mean, a wedding feast or a wedding celebration was supposed to last seven days. This wasn't a couple hours. This wasn't go to the reception and see if they picked the right kind of food and complain about the food. And you didn't want anybody to complain about anything. This wasn't trying to upstage the bride or whatever else you want to do. At a, at a, you know, all the drama that happens at a wedding reception. It wasn't about that. This was a time to celebrate. You celebrate for a whole week. As long as they could. And so they had to gather food and supplies for a whole week. If you didn't have enough, and it wasn't just a wedding, but if you didn't have enough, you could be taken to court for that. You could be sued if you ran out of wine at a wedding. It, it was that important. You don't invite everybody to this thing and they take time off or they make arrangements to be able to be there and everything, and then you don't have what you promised. Now, we think that's kind of silly, but, I mean, come on. We could come up with some pretty silly lawsuits that happen in our country, too. So, let's not mock it too hard. But in particular, the bride's family, because the groom is supposed to provide all this. The bride's family could sue the groom's family for making them look bad. Because it, these were social events. These were huge. These had to do with your standing in the community. So these started with an engagement or, or with a betrothal where two fathers decide, hey, we're gonna, let's get our kids together, man. Let's do this. we got two families. This is good. If we bring them together, it'll strengthen the families. And, and we'll, you know, we'll be stronger together in our community. And it was such a big deal that when it was time, the families, they took the, the kids, they took the, the bride and they took the groom out to the, to the gates of the city where the judges sat, where all the caravans passed by, where all the, all the business was done. And they, they took them out there, and they made the deal in front of everybody. If you've been to one of our Passovers, you, you see Tracy and I kind of, kind of, not in a big way, reenact this. But the whole community agrees to this. Right? The fathers read out their... Their, uh, their deal with each other because they make financial deals and everything else concerning this whole deal. And the fathers read out their parts. And the other father is asked, 
do you agree with this? And he says, yes. And the whole crowd around him would shout, amen. And then the other father reads his part out. And, and so there's, and it's the same thing. And so, you know, you have a big witness to this, just the betrothal part. And the groom comes up to the, to the bride and pours her a glass of wine. She can still say no. She would bring great shame on her family if she does. But she can say no. She has the right to do that. They can't do anything about it. The fathers can't stop her from saying no. So he pours a glass of wine and he hands it to her. And if she takes it and she drinks the whole thing, she's accepted the, the engagement, the proposal. And one of the things he would say, if you read through now, I, I hope this makes you go back and read through all of the, the Last Supper, all the last Passover passages. Because one of the things that the groom would say there is, I won't drink this again until I'm with you in my father's house. Because see, he's going back to his dad's house, and he's going to add on to his dad's house. And for the next year, he's building on to his father's house, because there's not a lot of room. You know, and, and it was probably a build up and not a build out. And so for the next year, he works on this room. And in the process of all that, he's gathering together everything he needs for this, this celebration. And then he goes in the, and finally he, he starts bringing dad up to check out the room, to check out the add-on. And, and his dad's like, yeah, no, not yet. Nah, no, because he, he has to get permission from his father to go and get his bride. And finally, dad wakes him up, and, and it's getting close. Everybody knows it's close. The bride knows the, the time is coming, so she's dressed. She's sleeping in her, wedding, in her wedding gown. Her bridal party is with her, staying in the house. The bridegroom's groomsmen are staying at his house. And finally, dad says, it's time to go get your bride. And the celebration starts in the house. And the trumpets are, are blowing, the shofars are blowing, the lights are coming on, the torches, they pour out into the street of the city, they parade through the street. And so everybody's coming out to watch and everybody's coming out to celebrate. And they go to the bride's house and he starts to call the bride's name and she comes out. And she's ready. And they bring a litter, a chair. And they set the bride in the chair and the groomsmen pick her up and they carry her away to the father's house. Sound familiar? How many of your verses have you been growing up in church do you come to mind just hearing that? And then for seven years, or seven weeks, seven days, they're celebrating at the father's house. That, that in itself, just in the betrothal, tells us that the pre-tribulation rapture is built right into the culture. It's not just in the Bible. It's built into their culture. That the Son will come and take us away. Jesus promised, I am going to my Father's house and I'm going to build you on. I'm going I'm I'm to prepare it. I'm going to get things ready. And he tells us in, in the beginning of Acts, nobody knows but the Father. They said, when are you going to come back again? Nobody knows but the Father. The Father will send me when it's time. But he promised, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you can be also. And then you go to Daniel chapter 9 and you see the 70 week prophecy of, of Daniel. Daniel that is spoken toward Israel, and we know that 69 of those weeks have been fulfilled. They're weeks or groups of years. 69 have been fulfilled, according to Daniel chapter 9, when Jesus came in to Jerusalem on the donkey on Palm Sunday. When he presented himself as the king. And then there's a pause, an undefined pause. The time of the Gentiles. That's us. The time of the church. The church age, sometimes you'll hear it. But that last week of years still has to be fulfilled. 
How long is the tribulation time? Seven years. And that'll be the 70th week of Daniel. It is focused on Israel and not the church. This idea that the church needs to be disciplined and the church needs to be beat up a little bit and purged or whatever other idea they have is not in the Bible. It's a pre-tribulation rapture. That time is focused on Israel for the completion of her sin, the finishing of her sin. It's for the time when they finally look and they realize and they recognize their Messiah. And then the wedding happens. During that time, it'll be our wedding feast, the wedding feast of the bride or of the, of the groom. So back to this story. You can, we can talk about that forever later. Um, so when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, that makes every especially young man cringe. It did me when I was a kid. Woman, really? Jesus just said woman to his, I can't imagine saying it to my mother. Not even now. My mom used to stand on a chair when me and my brothers got taller than her and said, you'll never be taller than your mother. And we believed it. Woman, what does, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. He's going to say that a few times in this book too. My hour has not yet come. Now, in, his, in, in that culture, woman was not particularly warm you know, it wasn't an affectionate term toward his mother, but it wasn't a derogatory term either. He wasn't insulting his mother. He wasn't belittling his mother. So he didn't have to worry about ducking, you know, he, none of that. Just woman. But he is saying our relationship has changed now. My hour hasn't come. This, isn't, this moment is not a mother-son time. This is a believer and Messiah time. He's saying, my hour to be completely revealed it hasn't come yet. So what does your concern have to do with me? And she doesn't argue with him. She doesn't set him straight. I think she acknowledges what he's saying. Because she's heard this before. Remember, they lost Jesus. Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. Can you imagine the panic? You've had angels appear to you and tell you you have the Messiah. You, you're the, the promised one of Israel is going to be born to you. And you're halfway back home with the caravan. And she thinks Joseph has him. And Joseph thinks she has him. And they finally get together after a couple of days of travel and say, where's Jesus? And I, I thought you had him. And they have to go back to Jerusalem. And they find him, and they're like, what are you doing to us? And he said, well, where did you think I would be? I have to be about my father's business. She knows there's a day coming when she has to let go. This relationship is not exactly the same. Now, in some respects it was, because we even see on the cross, he says to John, and to Mary, woman, behold your son, look at me. And he says to John, behold your mother. And he commits her care to John. But in the grand scheme of things, this relationship is not the same. It, it, it's done right here. And she just says, you know, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. She's not going to argue with him. Whatever he tells you to do, that's what you do. She didn't give him instructions except for that. 
She's not involved in this scene at all anymore. In fact, these are the last words of Mary that are recorded in the Bible. Whatever he tells you to do, go do it. Complete submission. You submit to him. She's submitted to him. She, she's turned and she's gone. Now she knows his family and is close enough to this family that this horrible thing has happened. They've run out of wine. Her concern is the welfare of this family. It's not her and it's not setting Jesus up to be, you know, it's not his great unveiling, his great revealing. But she knows this is an impossible thing. There's no sneaking out and buying more wine because money's probably gone too. The budget for this is, is I'm sure, done. And so he just goes, she goes to him. You're the only one that can help. And, and whatever he tells you to do, do it. Think about when she was told what was going to happen to her as a young girl. You're betrothed to Joseph, but you're going to get pregnant right now. The father is going to make you pregnant. You're going to conceive, you're going to bear a child. That's going to wreck her life. Any standing she had in the community could be gone because she's going to be pregnant before the wedding, before the wedding day. When they go to Bethlehem, there's no room in the inn. There's no room in any family member's houses either. And hospitality is huge in the Middle East. That's huge to reject somebody. But her response to that is, let it be. What, let, what you have said, let it be done to your maidservant. Now she turns to the servants and says, you do whatever he tells you to do. It says, now there were set, uh, now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So they're stone pots. These aren't even clay pots. These are stone, carved out of stone pots. Because you could have imperfections in clay, but that which came out of the earth, that came out whole, if you just chisel that out, then that's not going to be, that's not as easy to have uh, defiled. But these are stone pots. These are heavy pots. Six of them. 20 to 30 gallons apiece. Now, I carried a five-gallon bucket of water this morning out to my goats. And that was more than enough for me. I, 20 to 30 gallons. Wherever the water is coming from. You got to go out to a well. You got to go down to a river or a creek. You're making trips, man. You're not carrying these stone pots back and forth and filling them up. 20 or 30 gallons is a, is a lot of weight in a stone pot. You know, they're set there, and, and people are going up, and they're, they're pulling, they're dipping the water out to ceremonially clean themselves. That's what this was for. So this isn't water you went and drank. This is water you washed up with. So Jesus says to them, fill the water pots with water. And they fill them up to the brim. So nothing else can be in there. But look, it didn't say, they didn't ask why. They didn't hesitate. They just went and did it. Well, Mary told them to. <laughs> Come on. There were a lot of things my mom told me to do. That started off well and didn't end fully done. And, and probably that many more that didn't end without questions like why. But these servants are submitted to Jesus now. 
and not because Mary has any special authority. She's God. She's not overseeing what they're doing. She just said, just do whatever he tells you to do. And she's God. She's back to the party. And they're purification pots. What's he going to do with these? These are supposed to be clean. Or these are for cleansing, for cleaning yourself. Where They would tip the water. Like at Passover, we have a little bowl there. We have the two-handle pitcher that I, that I use to show. That they would take it and they'll start up here and let the water run off their fingertips. And then so they don't defile this hand by touching something that this hand was already touching that hasn't been cleaned yet. They have two handles on there. They grab the other handle and they do the same with the other arm. The other hand. So there's ceremony to this. You don't, you don't just take these and just fill them up and put up. They're, they're not there for wine. But they filled them up to the brim. So they've been being used. So then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. We don't know when this turned into wine. We don't know if it turned into wine in the pot. We don't know if it turned into wine after they pulled it out and it was sitting in another, another cup. Or we don't know if they, as they poured it from a pitcher and they poured it into the master's cup that it turned into wine in his cup. We don't know. We don't know at what point the miracle took place. But we have the testimony of the master. This is when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out good wine, or the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, uh, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. So you have servants who are being obedient. They're just being, doing what God wants them to do, what Jesus wants them to do. And this is a miracle. But oftentimes we think that the miracles or, or the things that come from God have to happen like right now. It's one guy, say the name of Jesus, lays his hands on somebody, and the miracle happens. But the works of God, God wants his, ser his servants to be involved in. I'm not saying that never happens. But more often than not, the provision of God comes from his servants being obedient and being involved in the work. Jesus didn't get up and touch the pot and have it happen. He didn't go get any of the water. He didn't bless the water as far as we know. He didn't take it to the master's table. He just said, go and do this. Now, wine in the Bible is symbolic of joy. The church often thinks of it just being symbolic of the blood of Jesus. But what brings us joy? It's that relationship that that blood made possible. Our joy comes from him. It's not, you know, and it's, it comes from his shed blood. But biblically as a whole, wine is symbolic of joy. In Psalm 104, it says that he brings forth the wine that makes men's heart glad. You know, he, he's giving credit to God for everything that happens and that's one of the things that he mentions so the whole growing of the grapes and the vine and the process that happens in, in the ferment, fermentation all of that, that's all part of it and so it speaks of joy but water and we talked about this a little bit last week when we were talking about the, the tabernacle water is symbolic of the word of God these servants filled these vessels up and if those vessels are symbolic of us beyond just the servants those vessels symbolically if you want to do the symbolism thing being full of the word of God 
then experience the joy of God. You say, how are you tying all that together? Jesus would tell us that he came to give us joy. Let me read. I've got things here. John 14. In John 15, 11, I'm sorry. It says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So his words are tied to our joy. He has said in the verses right before that, in John chapter 15, still says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that your joy, or that my joy, may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things, that I have heard, or that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you may go, or that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So his word is where we, where we get joy, right? I've spoken these things to you so that my joy will remain with you. First John. Chapter one. John tells us the reason for writing this epistle in first John it says, and these things are we write to you that your joy may be full. The word of God has everything to do with our joy. If you want your joy to be full, then be full of his word. You don't just come and say, okay, fill me with joy. Fill me up with the wine. He didn't do that. He, he filled him up with water. The, the symbol of his word. And it converted to joy. It was transformed. It was made new into joy. If you want joy, you need to embrace the word of God. All of it. Let him fill you to the brim with it. People make much of just being filled with the Spirit. Or the name of Jesus does everything. But in Psalm 138, he says he's, he has elevated or exalted his name or his words even above his name. Well, you don't know the names of God if you don't know the Word of God. You don't know Jehovah Jireh. You don't know Jehovah Shammah. You don't you don't know any of those names. You don't know Jesus. You don't know Emmanuel. You don't know that God's with us if you don't know his word. There are a lot of people who walk around saying, oh, I know Jesus. And they know nothing of him. They'll tell you to your face, hey man, he is okay with, with me the way I am. And We've got this agreement, me and the big man upstairs. I can tell you how many times I've heard that since I've been a pastor. Me and the big man, you don't need to talk to me about anything because me and the big man, we got our own agreement. We don't. You don't have your own agreement. It's right here. This is where it is. If it's not based out of this, buddy, you don't have any agreement. Somebody has lied to you and it's not God. If you don't know him, you don't have him. 
Jesus said there are going to be many on that day that are going to say to me, Lord, Lord. He's going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. And they're going to say, do we heal people? Do we cast out demons in your name? He said, I don't know you, you wicked servant, you wicked person. Because you don't know him. You don't know his word. Signs and wonders are nothing if they don't line up with the word of God. And if you don't know him, he doesn't even argue. He's not going to argue with them about whether they did anything or not. I don't know you. You need to know him. You need to know his word. You need to be full of his word. Lord, I hope I didn't stretch that little symbolism too far. So now a lot of people will say, well, Jesus endorses drinking. Hey, you change the water to wine. And then other people will argue, well, no, it's not really wine. It was just grape juice. But they're both wrong. The wine certainly is a symbol of joy. And it was part of their celebration. But wine typically in that day was diluted by water. One part to two. So one part wine, two parts water. Or two to three. Very few occasions when it was straight, solid, no diluted wine. One of those was at the, at the um, betrothal between the, uh, the bride and the bridegroom. I hear stories about people going to Passover. Man, by the time we get done drinking all four cups, I was feeling pretty good. You weren't doing it right then. They diluted the wine at the Passover because fermentation is leaven. And it had to be stopped. That process had to be stopped to be part of Passover. So if you're getting drunk at the table which is what Paul talks about in Corinthians, you're out of line. You're at a misrepresented Passover, if that's what you're doing. That's, that's the Bible. That's not me. And drunkenness in the Bible is always a sin. So they weren't getting slammed. I know the master says, you know, you keep the good stuff out only until they drink a little bit. Or they have well drunk, and everybody says, "Well, see, everybody gets drunk at the feast, or at the feast, and and so then you bring out the cheap wine, and no, that's what your friends do to get you sick at your parties." Unfortunately, I know too much about this stuff. You save the, you, you bring out the good wine first, and as the parties progress through the week, the lesser wine is coming out. The food's running out. The wine's running out. The more expensive stuff at the very beginning, when everybody's super happy, that's when it's coming out. That's all that means. So can you drink? Yeah, the Bible tells you you can. But drunkenness is always a sin. Always a sin. And Solomon warns, that you're not to take hard drink. Those things are used, it's used medicinally. But from his mother, she says, don't, don't drink to excess, and especially not the hard stuff, basically is what she's saying. Those things aren't fit for a king. They're not fit for the prince. Because that's the person who's in a position of authority to make decisions. How many weddings have you been to when the bride and groom make fools out of themselves because they've had too much? Or anybody else at the wedding, for that matter. I've had him say to me the next day, I don't even remember what happened at our reception. How wonderful is that? You're celebrating your, your marriage, and you don't even remember what you celebrated. Which tells you a lot about the wedding night, doesn't it? Listen, in our culture, one out of every 10 persons becomes addicted to alcohol with their first drink. So this isn't an endorsement to drink. One out of every 10. And the Bible's pretty clear. We don't let anything else have that kind of control over us. 
It doesn't matter if it's alcohol, it doesn't matter if it's drugs, it doesn't matter, what, whatever the vice. If you have a, a, a weakness that can grab a hold of you and control you, stay away from it. If you have a conviction to never drink, don't let anybody bully you into doing it. Assume that that conviction is from God. Don't use it to look down on people. Don't use it to, to judge people. Although they're going to tell you you do. And if you refuse to drink in front of, of, of anybody who's even just a social drinker, but you'd refuse, they're going to try to make you feel bad about not joining in. Don't do it. Assume that God's put that conviction on you for a reason. One, to protect you because he knows your weakness already that you don't have any knowledge of yet. Or two, because you are going to have opportunity to minister to somebody else in this area somehow. So if he's put that conviction on you to not drink, don't. If you, if, you know, Paul said, all things are permissible, but he followed it up with not all things are beneficial. Just because it's permissible in the Bible doesn't mean it's going to benefit you. Pray about it. You know, I know people who, who want to hang on to the Bible doesn't tell us not to drink so hard that they don't care who they would drink in front of. They would not set aside their liberty, their liberty to drink for the sake of an alcoholic or anybody else. They're going to exercise their freedom. That's a real American thing to say. I'm all about freedoms. I want us to keep our freedoms. I think there's times to exercise our freedoms. But with freedom comes great responsibility to know how and when to exercise them. I feel bad for other countries that don't have the freedoms that we have, and I feel horrible about the freedoms that we are losing that my grandchildren won't ever experience. But that comes because we did it with excess. We did it without responsibility for the freedoms that we were given by God. And that's, that's what we're facing now. And now, we, now we're scratching and clawing to try to hang on to things. Well, it's the same way with your biblical freedoms, the things that God has set you free from or set in front of you and say, hey, man, this is all okay if you want to. But you don't exercise your freedom at the expense of a brother or sister or at the expense of misrepresenting God. You want to have a drink? Have a drink. You want to have a glass of wine with dinner? Have a glass of wine with dinner. I don't I don't care. I'm going to argue with you about that. It's always that person who wants to argue with me. You want to use it in cooking? Use it in cooking. I have. I do. But, listen, stop arguing about whether you can or not. If you can, then shut up and just do it. If you... If, if God doesn't let you, then hang on to that conviction. Honor God with it. If you can drink, make sure you're drinking to honor God. Do it at home when, when then I'm, in a, I'm just hiding and I'm. I don't. There, there's no wonder with somebody who wants to argue about this. Yes, the Bible says you can drink. Wine is part of having a joyful heart. But drunkenness is always a sin. And if you can't figure out how close you can get to it, then don't do it. You know, if you've got to drain your glass and everybody else is around you, you probably got a problem. And this isn't somebody who's been dry all of his life. So, unfortunately, I have both seen and experienced on my own that 
the bad side of this. You know, I've known too many people who have destroyed their lives for this. To be able to say, yeah, it's a good thing, go ahead. Letting something have power over you. And listen, if you are hell-bent on exercising your freedom, regardless of who's around you, then you got a pride issue, and that's a whole nother sin. All right, enough of that. This was a good thing. He changed the water to wine. He took his, what represented his word, what cleans us, what's meant for cleansing, and he turned it into something that represents joy. And he blessed this family with it. And he kept them socially out of trouble. But it says here, this beginning, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So we, we get caught up in that and I probably spent too much time on the argument about whether you drink or not. The reality of it is here is God, Jesus revealed his glory here. There was obedience. And obedience is tied to, to following his word. We read in, in John, and you can look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, 1 John 2, 17. I'm, not, I'm out of time, so we're not going to get into all these. John 14, 23, James 1, 22. Obedience is also tied to God's word. And it's tied to glorifying him when we do it. So there was obedience. There was a representation of his word. There was a representation of his breaking from his relationship with his mother and starting his ministry in, in this kind of way. And his disciples believed in him. Now his disciples obviously believed in him before this. But we're to grow in our faith. They're going to have their minds blown for three years. They've only spent three days. <laughs> They're going to have their minds blown for three years of what God can do. And then beyond that, after his resurrection, after his ascension, the things that he does through the power of the Holy Spirit in them, what God is going to do is just going to blow them away for the rest of their lives to the point that they will go to their death never denying Jesus. And, and not just them, many since then. You're going you're gonna to see things. And you're going to be in his word. As you, as you get into his word, you're going to read and you're going to dig into things and your mind is going to be blown. You're going to grow. You're going to believe more. You only have to start off believing enough that Jesus takes away your sin. That if you ask him to forgive you of your sin, he'll do it. Romans chapter 10, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Sounds easy, doesn't it? It's easy for those of us, though, who walked with him for a time. How easy was it, especially if you came to faith as an adult, how easy was that step? Probably not very. I'm thankful that I came as a kid. And have that childlike faith. Oh, this is the Bible's the word of God. Okay. Well, it says this in the Bible. All right. I believe. Boom. I get older and I dig into this more. And wow, there's a lot of levels to this. There's a whole different. This is great. I had no idea that this was so valuable to me as a child. Now I know it is. Now I want to do more. We, we've been here 11 years. I learned something new just about every single week just getting ready. Or I'm refreshed in something I already knew. You know, going through the Psalms on Wednesday night, we, we covered the last two Psalms of, of the Ascent. When everybody was walking up to Jerusalem, they would sing the Psalms of Ascent. It was 120 to 134, I think it is. 
every time they, you know, when they walk up the hill to Jerusalem, the caravans, everybody, they're all singing these songs. One of them is a kind of a, a going away as they're leaving the temple. And they're ble- the people are blessing those who stay in the temple. All night. For those of you who stand in the temple, bless the Lord and worship the Lord. And, and then they bless the people as they're leaving. And I'm like, who stands in the temple all night? Well, a priest? Was it three priests, 24? Three, P, three priests, 24 Levites, and the temple guard captain stay in the te- would stay in the temple all night. It was never left unattended. Even today, the Whaley Wall, it's never left unattended by a Jew. All night long, there's somebody at the wall. And you get there late and everybody leaves, and you, you can't leave until somebody else shows up. Somebody decides to stop in and late at night. <laughs> I've heard people tell this story. Stop in late at night. You know, they come in late at night. They're going to pray. The guy who's been standing there waiting for somebody else to come will leave quick before the other guy can leave. But they, their, their mindset is you don't leave it unattended. It's still there. Just learn that this week, getting ready for Psalm 134. So that's what I'm saying, man. There's new things all the time to, to dig out and dig up to make you ask questions. I promise you we wouldn't get past 12, so let's read it real quick and then we can, we can get. It says, after this, they went, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. So they left. After everything was done, after his revealing his glory, according to John, after this great event, after bringing joy or making sure the joy of the feast of the wedding continues, after that, he leaves. He doesn't, he doesn't stand up, everybody worship me. He doesn't, you know, hey, this is the first one I ever did. Hey, none of that. Everybody pay attention to me. He just changed that to water. He let the feast go on. And when it was time, he got up and he left. Why? Remember what he said to his mother? My hour has not yet come. The full revealing of who he was wasn't yet. But the works began. The signs began there. All right. I could go on forever, so we're not going to do that, though. Bottom line is, he wants to fill you with joy. You want to know how that happens? Get in his word. Let him speak to you. Be an obedient servant. Be in his word. Be involved in the ministry. Be involved in his work. And it will fill you with joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. I say that every week. Lord, I am thankful for your word. And I, I, I pray that everyone here and everyone listening today or sometime in the future would come to cherish your word. Like their Bibles are one of the most or the most valuable thing that they have. Lord, that we would take on the mentality of the psalmist who said that your words have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to everybody here. Lord, I pray that we would look for our answers here in your word and not 
in this world and not in men or women or anybody else that we've elevated to some kind of high position. And Lord, I pray that your word would protect those who have seen those elevated fall. It's your word that protects us from their fall. Lord, I pray that people would dig into your word to know your name, to really know you. And Lord, I pray that we would even still see more miracles in our lives. But Lord, make it obvious that they're from you and nobody else. We love you and thank you. And we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.